Good morning, everyone. It's fantastic to see such a big crowd here in my home. And this is my home. It's been Julianne in my home for, goodness, 25 years. Our offices used to be, my office was in that corner there, and Julianne was, was next door. And that was where um, myself and my fantastic team built um, Sports Division. Um, we're still in the building today, but the most important thing that's in the building today is eSpark. And that's why I'm delighted to see you all here today. So why is eSpark important? <clears throat> it's very simple. Steve Jobs, 1997, just getting Apple going. So any business starts with an idea. Any business starts with one person. One person. And turning that idea into reality is absolutely really difficult. And right here in Scotland, in the past, we have not been that good at it. And my passion is to help make us a lot better at it. A lot better at it all over the UK. And that's why when Jim Duffy came to see me only some three years ago, he started with an idea. And today, eSparks are happening all over the UK. And I'm probably going to bust a PR protocol here, Marianne, by saying he's going international as well. Am I allowed to say it? I've said it. Anyway. I've said it. <laughs> so sue me, Duffy, wherever you are. Um, but it's a really exciting announcement. I'm, I'm not sure where he's saying it, but uh, anyway, I've just mucked that up. Anyway. <laughs> So what, what is eSpark all about? So when you have an idea, when you've got a blank sheet of paper and you're thinking, goodness, I, I, this is something I really want to do. First of all, you've chosen to do something really difficult. It's really difficult to do this, but it's difficult for a reason. Because when and if you succeed, it is one of the most fulfilling things that you will ever do. So. What chimed with me when Duffy came to see me was his idea was to have a hatchery where like-minded people came together. Because when you start, it's a very lonely time as well. Many of you are kind of nodding, going, yeah, I know. Maybe some of you just now are taking advantage of um, free Wi-Fi in a coffee shop or you're sitting in your bedroom being a sad and lonely figure. Well, that's not what eSpark's about. With eSpark, you can come in and you can meet like-minded people. Because when you think that the challenge in your business is the only challenge that MD's ever faced in the world, guess what? I, I don't believe that. I believe there are challenges that have been faced before and solved. All we've got to do is join up and say, yeah, what's wrong this morning? Mm, I'm struggling to pay the wages on Friday. Yep, I couldn't pay them last Friday. Come on, we'll have a cup of tea and we'll talk about it. And once you begin to speak to the other people in East Park, you begin to say, goodness, I'm, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only weirdo or freak who has this challenge. There's actually lots of weirdos and freaks in this building and we're all coming together to do something amazing. So that's why I'm so passionate about East Park. The reason that you guys are so important is that I recently read a report that in the United States, they did a longitudinal study, and over the past 20 years, almost all of the new jobs coming out of the American economy came from businesses that were less than five years old. So that's you guys, which is amazing to think doesn't come, you know, when I was growing up, about 20 miles from here, the careers officer in my school was go down the pit, it's a job for life, someone else will take care of you. Well, guess what? No more pits. Another interesting piece 
of research is that for our young people coming out of school and going into the workplace today, it says they're going to have about six different jobs in their life. There's no more jobs for life. And therefore, these young people may be coming to join you. And that's why I'm also passionate that our education system equips our young people for the world of work in which they're going to enter. And maybe they need to be coming to join a small company. And that's why I'm so passionate that in our schools we are teaching, working together as a team, problem solving, communicating, understanding these small teams, because that's the world of work that our young people are probably going to go into and you're probably going to offer them a job. That's the fact. So we've got to change our education system. We've got to get more support behind people who want to start and grow their businesses. Because during the, the Scottish referendum, there was this thing said that, you know, we, we want a fairer society in Scotland. And I, I don't think MD would ever argue with that. I don't care what side, I'm, I'm not politically aligned. And I don't care what side of the political divide you're from. We all pretty much agree in this room this morning that we want a fairer Scotland. But how do we pay for our free prescriptions and our health care and education system and free care for the elderly? The answer is you and me. The answer is the only way we pay for it is if you can grow your business, employ one person, that person pays the national insurance, that person spends in the local economy, the, the VAT receipts come in and the world keeps turning. And if you don't bother, the tax receipts go down and we cannot have a fair society in Scotland. That's why I am so passionate that you succeed. Because Scotland and indeed the people out there in the World Wide Web, that's the only way economies and fair societies happen. It's as simple as that. So, if you're thinking of starting your business this morning, you've got an idea, people think a bit crazy, you heard Steve Jobs, Apple started with one person and one idea, and he had these ups and downs. He was actually sacked from Apple. So if any of you have been sacked in the past wee while, it's not the end, let me tell you. I've been sacked a few times. In fact, Julianne sacks me most days <laughs> because she is the boss. So, what can I tell you? Growing up in a wee town 20 miles from here, New Cumnock, I guess business was in my bones right from the get-go. My dad was a local grocer. Um, New Cumnock then was a flourishing mining village, and, and I reckon... 85, 90% of the male employment was the pits. And I was working with my dad from an early age. But when the miners' strike came and the mines never really reopened, um, my dad had to close the shop. But you would think, and I, and I watched him suffer as he thought he was a failure. But it just shows you that out of something even as bad as that, good can happen. And he put a small amount of money in with another local Cumnock businessman and he wanted to sell shoes. And I suppose when I look back, and Steve Jobs says it, you can never work out, you can't join the dots looking forward, only looking back. And if, if my dad hadn't had to shut his shop, which was really painful for him at the time, but if he hadn't did that, he wouldn't have put the money in and he wouldn't have sold shoes and maybe I wouldn't have said, trainers, this looks interesting. Because that's what happened. They had market stalls in Ayr and Irvine. They did um, the Barras, Ingleson Market. And um, I noticed that trainers were a big part of it. And I thought, what have I got to lose? My girlfriend at the time could type, which was great. Um, she did chuck me afterwards because I was working all the time. But um, at least she could type. Um, and I wrote to two existing retailers and said, look, I've noticed some space in your store. Can I have that space for my shoes? Which I didn't have. And um, one of them remarkably said, yep, come on down. It was in the north of England. 
and they said, this is great, we're a jeans shop, trainers, that sounds great, can you open in Leeds, Aberdeen and Sunderland? So I, I left muttering about shop fitters and we were flat out and I, I do remember driving back to, to, to Air at the time where my parents lived, saying to my dad, God, the good news is they said yes, the bad news is I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> and maybe a lot of you this morning, if you've got an idea, think, I don't know what I'm doing. So you need the help. My dad was my mentor. He was my hero as well. Um, but everybody needs that. And that's why coming into eSpark, you can come and say, right, I, I'm not quite sure. And the mentoring and the support that Frank, Marianne, and this fantastic team here give is simply world class. And I don't use that word often, but I'm really proud to say that in this building, there is world class mentoring for those of you who want to grow, those of you who want to start your business. They will take you through and support you through this pretty difficult time, but then you become part of something really special and part of something really big. And my dad gave me that support. But, you know, I still think it's, it's not the natural thing to do, but it's got to become natural. It's got to become something that people say, yeah, I'll give that a go. And one of the first things Frank and his team will tell you in here that don't, don't be afraid of failure. Don't be afraid of trying. Because if you're going to fail, fail quick and fail cheap and start again. You know, we had the pleasure of, listen, of listening to Pierre Omadier, who's the founder of eBay. So, fantastically successful guy, and he sold his stake in eBay, multi-billionaire, and he, and he invests in small companies. And he said, when they come to him, his first question is, tell me about a failure you've, you've had. And if they say, well, I haven't had one yet, he said, well, go and have some. <laughs> and, and come back and see me. What, what a fantastically positive way to look at it. So don't worry about, oh, that didn't work before. So what, you give up and you never try again? No, you're now more experienced. I'm picking on you, sir. I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've had wonderful failures. <laughs> but once you've had that experience, and I would see it as experience, and listen, I'm... I still make mistakes. I still make mistakes every day. But hopefully we learn from them and then hopefully we move on. So when we get, Frank, how are we doing for time? Okay. We're okay. Um, because once we get to the Q&A, you can ask me anything you want. I'm not quite sure what you want to hear about, but you can ask me about anything that's been um, going on either in our West Coast Capital Private Equity business or the Hunter Foundation. There's some amazing things going on there. And this is why in the Hunter Foundation, I see you and our chief exec at the back there, you can ask him all the difficult questions. Um, we have been trying, goodness, for about 20 years to support people who want to start and grow their businesses. And we support in very many ways, right from schools, as I said, getting our young people equipped for the world of work. You know, I, my challenge to the educationalists is what you're teaching and how you're teaching it is pretty much the same as when the career officer said, go down the pit. Well, the world of work has changed. Wake up. We're doing our young people a disservice if we're not equipping them for this world of work, which is natural to you, and I think it's got to be natural for them. We're supporting eSpark and this wonderful thing that's happening. We're supporting the edge. So when we looked at how we could support people who are trying to start and grow their businesses, the early stage financing is the most risky part of the investment curve. And there wasn't a market mechanism that was working. Therefore, Duffy went to see John Swinney John Swinney, in a heartbeat, got it. I've got to take my hat off to the Scottish government. But then we said, look, this, this can't be only a government initiative. 
and John Swinney absolutely agreed. So myself and Ross McEwen of RBS put money in and the edge now and the final takes place um, next Friday over in Gogerburn. So this is where you guys can pitch for money for this hardest to fund early stage. And it's really taken on its own life. And I'm, I'm really proud that we're involved with this edge funding. So at every stage, just trying to support. Hopefully one day there will be a market mechanism the way there is in Silicon Valley, where people, once you've had successes, hopefully you want to put something back in to help the next entrepreneur on this ladder. Because that's the way we see it. It's a real ladder of success. And for those trying to get on the first rung, those of us who've had a bit of success need to give a hand up. And it's just the same as, as what we do in our foundation. It definitely is a hand up and not a hand out. If we get a hand out, we're going to get a dependency culture, which I really don't want. We became too dependent on the pits and steelmaking and shipbuilding, all government industries, which pretty much no longer exist. We've got to take care of ourselves. That's the big message about eSpark. There's one person who'll sort it, and that's you. It's not government. It's not indeed Frank. It's not Marianne. It's you. And the mentors who come in to eSpark and really help are the ones who will get it and will help you along the way. But we really want you to succeed. So for those of you in the room today, I hope I've set out the importance of small and growing businesses. Scotland absolutely depends on you if we're going to be successful. And for people in the rest of the UK, small businesses are simply the lifeblood of our economy. And I want to wish every single one of you good luck and success in your businesses. Thank you very much. Thank you. There we are. Thank you very much. Ready for some Q&A? Yes. So it'd be great, folks, if you can get some hands up in the audience who has got a question for some Tom. <laughs> we'll come to you. We're going to a couple of questions from Twitter. Twitter's been going crazy this morning. But a couple of hands up if you get questions for some Tom, for some Tom just now, and we'll come to you. We've got one there. One at this side. We'll get the mics linked up to you. One here. And we'll come back to you in a wee minute. Okay. So, Tom, what habits did you have to form in order to become as successful as you are? And that's from Nelson Contracts. Nelson Contracts habits. Well, um, I think the habit which every single person in this room can get is a can-do attitude. So this is something that maybe some people in the audience, because we are in the west of Scotland this morning, saying, what's he talking about? <laughs> How are you today, Tom? I am all right. <laughs> How are you today, Tom? I'm doing really great. Is he from America or something? <laughs> you sure he's from you coming up? You decide in the morning when you get up what kind of day you're going to have. And you, if you're a leader of your business, whether it's you're the only person in that business, whether you employ one person, you've got to set the tone. So if I come in in the morning and go, Julian, how are you? And she says, yeah, I'm great. I said, how are you, Tom? I'm all right. <laughs> she knows to batten down the hatches. <laughs> it doesn't happen very often. Is that right, Julian? Yeah. Yes. Um, but a can-do attitude and a positive attitude, you can decide. And that's something you decide every morning when you get up. Whether you feel like it or not, you've got to put on the face. Because if you do, pretty much it's contagious. But the other thing is contagious as well. If you're a moaner, you know, we talk about drains and radiators. Are you a drain or are you a radiator? Do people want to come up and get warmed by you? Or do they want to stay away because they're going to disappear down the drain? <laughs> Look at the person next to you and decide if they're a drain or a radiator. <laughs> we all want to Who be are radiators. You? Who are you? <laughs> Frank? Frank is a radiator. But we all want to surround ourselves with people who are positive, but not 
you know, a genuine positivity. So I would say, Frank, the best habit you can get is this can-do attitude, a positive attitude. Can-do and positive. Hope that's answered your question, Nelson Contracts. Okay, can we get a mic to the gentleman in the second row here? And he can put his question to Sir Tom. And you, you can Thank all you think, much. you can ask me anything you want. Brilliant. Go for it, Hi, sir. Yes, sir. Tom, Peter Easton, Green Home Systems. I think you can answer my question here, but I was going to ask you what can I motivate you? Because I imagine in your life you've had a lot of highs, but unfortunately I imagine you've had a lot of lows, sir. What keeps you motivated and what keeps you going? Good question, Peter. I think um, what keeps me going, what keeps me going is I, I, I genuinely believe that tomorrow's going to be better than today. <laughs> and I don't know if that's just something naturally strange within me. And I genuinely believe the best is yet to come. And when we sit either in our private equity business or in our foundation, and we see the opportunities that are in front of us, especially in, the, in the, our foundation with the opportunity to do, to do good, we go, wow, this is amazing. And, you know, I get home most nights Really excited. My wife can't stand me. By the, you know, I'm just too, I'm too excited by the thing. I said, well, you should see what happened today. This was great. And that was great. She said, Tom, calm down, for God's sake. Um, but I genuinely, I mean, somebody asked me the other day, oh, Tom, when are you going to write your book? And I said, what, why, why would I write a book? You know, I'm, I'm kind of halfway in this journey. And I genuinely, 100% believe the best still to come. And I've got to be at my best to execute that so I don't know if that answers your question but it's kind of it's kind of what I feel is that okay thank you yeah lady at the side good morning uh, Sorka O'Connor from Sealboards um, what's the biggest mistake you've made and what have you learned from it I made lots of mistakes um, suppose one of the biggest mistakes was when the financial crisis hit we in our private equity business were not ready. We didn't see it coming. And plenty of people go, oh, Tom, nobody saw it coming. Yeah, they did. Plenty of people saw it coming. I, I have now become an anorak about the financial Any crisis. Questions? I've read every book Any about questions? it. I've tried to really learn from the mistakes we made there. And um, we, if I'm honest about it, had lost our focus. We were too widely spread in the investments we were looking at. We were trying to do too much. And we did not stick to our knitting. Um, and therefore, when the crisis hit, we were in bad shape to deal with it. Um, but it was nobody else's fault. It was my fault. Absolutely 100% my fault. And I had to deal with it. Um, what did I learn from it? I learned that... Um, we've got to stick to our knitting, perhaps not believe our own bullshit. Not, is that going to be censored now, Frank? Yeah. You're okay with that. You're okay. Um, <laughs> and get back to the rudimentals of, of why we've been successful and really that laser focus we had in understanding businesses when we invest, understanding the people in the businesses when we invest, get back to the basics. Um, it was an expensive lesson, but a lesson nonetheless. And um, I mean, it'd been very easy for me to say, oh, that's for a game of soldiers, you know. Um, but and there were a few mornings where I could have stayed under the duvet. <laughs> um, but what would that have said to my team? So I had to come in every day and say, right, here's the challenge today. Let's knock them down one at a time. And I'm glad to say, I think today we're in better shape to take care of the opportunities that are coming because of the mistakes we made. So we're, we're learning from these mistakes and we're going to benefit from them in the future. I, I really firmly believe that. Is that okay? Yeah, thank you. One more from Twitter. So Tom, what is Investor Ready? And that's from Irene Dobson. So <laughs> what's Investor Ready in your eyes? Goodness, Investor Ready. Well. You know, there are many things that are investor ready, and it's just really what eSpark talk about a lot. Um, but somebody coming to me to be investor ready, yes, we need the business plan. And I don't want to belittle the business plan, but I have never read a business plan that ever, ever did what it said it was going to do. 
I know that's probably going against everything you teach not in here, all. Frank. Not at all. But, um, you know, and we look back and we laugh at some of the successes when we can, the failures we put in the bucket, but um, <laughs> business plans are a work of Hans Christian Andersen. They are fiction. Every sales line goes left to right in an upward only direction. <laughs> and there is, there is always a pot of gold in three years' time. <laughs> always. This is ringing true with some of you this morning. And um, life just isn't like that. Life is a roller coaster. And I've never read a business plan that says, in the first year, we're going to get a cash crisis. I'm not going to be able to pay the wages. Um, my wife's going to leave me. <laughs> and my children's going to hate me. And all my pals will think I'm mad. But that's sometimes what happens. But they don't put it in the business plan. You know. um, just as well, really. Um, it's never happened to me, by the way. Um, but I think investor ready means that the entrepreneur understands their business, is realistic about mm -hmm. what's coming ahead. Yeah, there's, it's, it's not just going to be like that. There's going to be ups and downs, but I'm equipped to deal with them. Okay. Um, I don't know what the challenges are ahead, but when they come, myself and my team know we can deal with them. We've built in contingencies. I absolutely live, eat and breathe this business. I've got a passion for it. I've got a passion for my, for my people and I'm really going to succeed. These are all the things that I like to see. Irene Dobson from Twitter. I hope that's answered your question. We'll go to the lady in the audience that's got a question for Sir Tom. She's got a mic. Good morning, Sir Tom. Excellent. Morning. Uh, Lynn Donoghue, Maureen, the Highland Princess. What is the most important experience you have learned and used positively? throughout your successful journey? Are you talking about experience? What, just to narrow it down for me, just so I know what's in your head. I would say an experience of life that you then forwarded to your successful journey to become a businessman that you felt was um, extremely important. I either for yourself, sorry Sir Tom, either for yourself or for all of us here. Yeah. Um, I think um, it's run about people because the other thing to say is every business starts with one person, but every successful business needs the collaboration of others. And that's a really hard thing to do. Really hard thing to do. You know, and the old fashioned way of one dictator at the top and everybody jumps to the dictator, I, that's not my style, it's not Julianne, and um, <laughs> that's not my style and I don't think it's the style of, of today, so I think if you're going to build something of scale, you need to bring people with you and in this day and age there is a shortage of talent and talent can move anywhere and therefore to, to attract the right talent that you want, you've, you've got to listen You've got to understand what these people who are thinking of joining you want. And um, you've, you've got to get them to understand your passion, your belief, and genuinely bring them along and value them along the way. Um, and if you can do that, you can build something of real scale. If you're not genuine about it, I think people suss it out in a heartbeat. And um, so I think just when, when dealing with people, you know, it was um, one of the best business books I've ever read is, is Sam Walton, Made in America. And it was about Sam's um, building up Walmart. So he started from nothing, became the world's richest guy um, through Walmart, which is Asda in the UK. And he's got 10 rules for success, which I adopted and I'm, I'll, I'd ask you to go and look at it. But one of the most important things that he said was um, a few sincere words of praise cost nothing and are worth a fortune. I think the sincere bit is really important, especially when you're from Scotland. Because <laughs> we suss it out. Absolutely. <laughs> is that okay? Yes. 
Thank you. Brilliant. Thanks for the question. We'll take one more question from the audience. So we'll get ready for you in a wee minute and we'll do the last question from Twitter, okay? Get a mic. One more question from Twitter. So Tom, what is the best way to set up a financially focused social enterprise in Ayrshire? And that's from Jenny Green on Twitter. Obviously interested in social enterprises. A financially focused social, social enterprise. enterprise. Well, first of all, and we're going to hear from David in a minute, I really think social enterprises are going to be the new wave We've invested with um, Josh Littlejohn when he's doing Social Bite, which is like coffee shops, like Pritamonji, except 100% of the profits go to charity. 25% of the workforce were formerly homeless. Um, and I think when entrepreneurial brains put their mind, and my kind of definition of a social business, and it, it may differ from David's, but that's absolutely fine, is you, you want these businesses to be 100% focused on profit. Profit's not a dirty word for a social business, but then 100% of those profits go to a good cause. So you've got the absolute business and you're working every day to maximize the profit, but then you can decide what to do with your profit. And Correct. I think it's got to be a very clear message. I've saw lots of social businesses that their message is, yeah, we give 10% of our profits to charity and when we do it, you know, Josh Littlejohn, 100% of the profits go to charity. No ifs, no buts, you're thinking 10% and there's, there's a few big corporations now beginning to latch on because it's good for their CSR or it's good for their, their image. I tell you what, today's generation sussed them out in a heartbeat <coughs> and you've got to be really genuine in your social aim. So Correct. I know that doesn't answer it, but it's the best I can do. Good answer. <laughs> Good answer from me. Jenny Green, thanks for the question. I'm sure you'll be looking forward to hear from David later on. We've got one more question to finish off the Q&A with Sir Tom from the audience, the lady in the second row. Hi, Tom. Go for it. Um, my question to you is, um, do you believe that charities need to become entrepreneurial to meet the millennium goals? And how can charities become entrepreneurial? So, um, I think this goes to a very good, good point, which is entrepreneurs come in all shapes and sizes, and we're going to hear from David in a wee minute. And, but one of the best entrepreneurs I have ever met is Mohammed Yunus um, of Grameen. And um, for those of you who want, Google him up, um, Professor Mohammed Yunus. And um, so he was an economist working in Bangladesh and working in one of the big universities. But in the 70s, there was very bad famine in Bangladesh. And Yunus got very upset that he was walking to his university to espouse economic theory while his fellow countrymen were dying at the side of the road of starvation. So he decided to say, right, I, let's, let's take this and go and find it. And, and basically, a long story short, he decided the women of Bangladesh were the answer to this and it was a financial thing. So he began to lend to them one at a time, but in a peer group, because they were mainly illiterate and had no rights in Bangladesh, so they couldn't sign a bank form. But he found something that was stronger, which was peer group. So I would lend to you, but you couldn't get the money until you'd paid it back. And Grameen now has got better payback than any Western bank. So he looked at a seemingly intractable issue and looked at it in a very entrepreneurial way. And therefore, I would say every organization can benefit from entrepreneurial thinking. I actually believe it's the only way. Because if we just keep on looking at problems the way we've always did, we're always going to get the same results, which are not good enough. You need to look at it a different way. And that's what you will learn coming into eSpark is to look at things Turn them in their head. Don't look at it. If, if, if you just build a normal company, you're just going to get normal results. Where it really takes off, if you're Mohammed Yunus or you're Steve Jobs, is because they think different. And thank you for letting me segue into how I started, which was think different. And I really genuinely believe that in Scotland and the rest of the UK today, we need more people thinking differently. It's the only way that our society moves forward in leaps and bounds. And that's why 
I'm so passionate about what happens in this building. That's why I support Frank and his wonderful team here in East Park. And that's why I really look forward to you guys coming and joining us on this amazing journey. Good luck. It's a fun point, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you.